Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good morning, brothers and sisters. May we all stand if you are able to. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks this morning. We praise your name and we glorify your name this morning for who you are. God, this morning as we come before your presence to worship you. Lord, I pray, God, that we will truly worship you this morning. God, I pray that as we worship, it will come up to you as a sweet-smelling savor. But God, first I ask of you to cleanse us. God, take away all our habits, of the bad habits, the distraction, everything that will prevent the praise from coming up to you, Lord. We present them to you this morning. And we ask you, Lord, to remove them. God, I pray that our hearts will be fixed on you. Because, Lord, you said that if, we, our, if our hearts and mind is fixed on you, you will give us peace. So, God, help us this morning. And we pray, God, that every burden will be lifted. Everything that is not of you will be cast down. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here we are in your presence.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The next song we are going to do is Your Excellent Jesus. Your Excellent.
Spirit of God created by human hands. You are God alone. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. 
you are God alone. This morning, Lord, as we come to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, God, we give you thanks. Lord, we praise your name. Lord, we exalt your name for who you are, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you are the great I am, that you are the all-sufficient one. You're the God who heal our diseases. You're the God who gives us peace. And so this morning, we worship you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you, God, for clothing us in our right mind. God, we thank you that we can be able to move around, Lord Jesus. We thank you, God, for our eyes that we can see our hands that we can do things, and our feet that we can move. Lord, we thank you for the fact that we could go to the bathroom this morning. We give you praise, Jesus. We give you glory, Lord, because God, you are a good God. In spite of, Lord, you are a good God. And mighty God, we just give you thanks this morning. Lord, we come to you and we present this morning's service before you. God, we have gathered here to worship you. And Father God, just as our faith differs, so each person differs. And we come, God, with all our circumstances. We come with all our problems. We come with the joy. We come with the sorrow. And God, we come this morning and we present them before you, Lord. Because God, you're the only one who can lift the heavy burdens. You're the only God who can, oh God, he's a troubled mind this morning. And so this morning as we come, Lord God, with the heavy burden them, with the troubled mind them, Jesus, we put them at your feet this morning. God, we pray, mighty God, that you will touch us another time. God, I pray, Father, that you will heal us another time, Father. God, I pray this morning that your name will be glorified in this place. God, your name will be exalted in this place, Jesus. We pray, mighty God, because, Lord, we do things that we shouldn't have done. We say things that we shouldn't have said. We think about things that we should not have thought about, God. And this morning, that caused us, oh God, to put a wall between us and you. But, Jesus, this morning, we come, Lord, that you will break them down. God, I pray this morning that you come, we come, God, that, Lord God, you will forgive us of all our sins. Cleanse us, O oh God, from all unrighteousness, mighty God. Mighty Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ this morning that as we come, Lord, and as we read the word, God, I pray, God, that the word will penetrate our hearts. Help us to read the, the word of God with the right mindset and the right attitude. God, help us not just to read it for reading's sake, but Lord, read it with understanding. So God, I pray this morning that you will open up our understanding this morning, Jesus. God, help us to understand what we read and what we hear, mighty God. Because, Lord, it is a word that gives life. It is a word that set us free, mighty God. So, mighty God, I pray this morning that you will move upon every heart this morning, Jesus. Mighty God, there are some of us who come this morning. And we feel like, God, we are bound. But, Jesus Christ, you are the deliverer. Jesus Christ, you are the one who is able to deliver. And so, mighty God, I pray, mighty God, that you will deliver your people this morning. I pray, mighty God, that you will break those chains that hold us captive. Hold us captive from praising you. Hold us captive from, captive from living right. God, break those chains this morning. Break the chains, God, that cause us, oh God, to be lazy from not getting up in the morning and pray. God, this morning, I pray, mighty God, that you'll break every chain, every chain in our lives, Lord. Everything, God, the things that we see and we don't see, Jesus. Because sometimes, God, your Holy Spirit tells us, Lord, that we don't know what to pray for. So, mighty God, we are asking, God, that the things that you've seen us, Lord, that 
does not need to be a part of our lives, Lord. We present them to you, mighty God, that, Lord God, you will remove them and you will break them this morning. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for our pastor this morning as he pre preached the word of God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will anoint him afresh. God, give him a word this morning. God, a word in this season. Because, Lord, we are living in troublesome time. God, when we look around us and see all the, the chaos and the mayhem, Lord Jesus, only you, God, can give us that peace. And, God, I pray that as the word comfort, Lord, we will apply it unto our lives. And, God, that we may be able to live victorious life this morning, Jesus. Because, Lord, sometimes as believers, Lord, we doubt you. We, we are fearful. But, mighty God, I pray, mighty God, that you remove the doubt from us, Lord. Remove the fear from us. Sometimes, God, we don't have faith in your word. And your word tells us, mighty God, that it is faith that pleases you. So, mighty God, I pray this morning that you'll increase our faith in you, God. And God, sometimes when we are for our faith to be increased, Lord, we are going to go through trouble. But mighty God, I pray, mighty God, that you will, oh God, so equip us, Lord God, that when those trouble times come, God, we will stand in your word, God, and we will stand, Lord God, having our lines girt about with truth, Lord, because, Lord, your word is all we need to move through this time. God, we thank you. And we pray, mighty God, that for the musicians, for the one who's going to read the word, for the ones who are going to sing, for the ones who are in the sound room, Jesus, I pray, mighty God, that you will bless them this morning. God, I pray that, Lord, you will touch each and every one of us, Lord. I pray, God, that we will not leave the way we came, but, God, we will leave Oh, God, re-energized. God, lifted up in our spirit. God, that we can, oh, God, go through the week again, living a victorious life. God, we just give you thanks this morning. We praise your name. We glorify your name for who you are, that you are God and God alone. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to be here this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God's peace to you. We are thrilled to have you join us today at Maypen Baptist Church. May this be a place where you feel at home and grow in faith. To those online, we welcome you and thank you for joining 
virtually every week. Is there any first time visitors with us today? Could you please stand? Okay. We are welcoming Sister Bennett's family. Could you please stand, please, or give us a wave? Welcome to Maypen Baptist Church. We are, I am asking you to stand so we could sing, let us greet someone in Jesus' name. <laughs> a little lower, please. T'was Jesus my Savior who died on the tree
shall break every chain and give us the victory again and again. Amen. Amen. At this moment, our first scripture reading will be taken from Proverbs 5, done by Sister Samantha Kep Minot. Good morning, brothers and sisters. The first scripture reading will be taken from Proverbs chapter 5. Please listen while I read. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her, bit, but her end is bitter as a wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof. And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and the assembly. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished away always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. 23 and last. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Here endeth a portion of God's holy word. We honor it by saying. At this moment, we will have our youth choir ministering to us. Praise the Lord, brethren. Praise the Lord. 
as we gather in the house of the Lord this morning, we are one in Christ, right? Amen. Amen. Let us draw near to each other. We are one. We are one. We are all sisters and brothers telling stories of our Father's love. Let us draw near to each other. We are one. We are one. We are Sisters and brothers telling stories of our Father's love. You got a place at the table, a family where you belong. So open your arms if you're able. Welcome home. Welcome home. Let us draw near to each other. We are one. We are one. We are all sisters and brothers at the feast of our Father's love. We can come weary and burdened with the weight of the world on our backs. We can hand it over to Jesus. Find, find our rest, find our rest. Let us draw near to each other. We are one, we are one. We are all sisters and brothers living free in our Father's love. Travelers, misfits, and exiles don't go cold in the dark of the night. Gather for hope and for comfort in his light, in his light. Let us draw near to each other. We are one, we are one. We are all sisters and brothers, warming hands by the fire of his love. Shaped by the hands of the potter, no two pieces alike. When we build a shelter together, we will shine, we will shine. Let us draw near to each other. We are one, we are one. We are all sisters and brothers telling stories of our Father's love. Let us draw near to each other. We are one, we are one. We are all sisters and brothers telling stories of our Father's love. We'll tell stories of our Father's love. We'll tell stories of our Father's I thank the youth choir for that beautiful rendition. Our second scripture is taken from Romans 1, and it will be done by Sister Andriana Harris. Our second scripture reading comes to us from Romans chapter 1, and this is an alternate reading, and for this we'll stand. Here beginneth. 
Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are we also the call of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God for Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Making requests. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor to both the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as is in me, so, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jews first, and also to the Greeks. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto me unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the loss of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up on vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned into their lust one, another, one toward another, Men with men working that which is unseemly, unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not lightly retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to their reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, 
covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, 32 and last, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The word of the Lord we honor it by saying, Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sister Harris, for the reading. At this time, we will have our special done by Brother Ashani and Sister Sienna. brothers and sisters. We're going to sing Ababa Power. Ababa Power. Ababa King. Ababa Nature. Oh 
to put your hands together for Brother Brown. The children doing what they are doing this morning is a result of Brother Brown. He, and we must, he faithfully take them to church and he has instilled in them what it is to serve the Lord. And we want to give God thanks for him, but also not to overlook the children. Put your hands together for them. There are many children who grow up in church, but they are not interested in the things of God. But these children are... Special, and it's the influence of the parent, the grandparent. All right. This morning, it's good to be in the house of the Lord again, and I rearrange that Bible verse, which is saying, "This is the day the Lord hath made; let us rejoice and be glad in it." But I'm always aware of human weakness. So I always say, this is the day the Lord hath made. Help me to rejoice and be glad in it. Because sometimes we want to rejoice, you know. But the challenges are overwhelming. And we find it difficult to rejoice. But by his grace, we can rejoice. I want to appeal to those in the audience and online that if you want to keep up with the reading, as you know that we read the scripture every time we meet. But some people may be wondering, oh, last Sunday we read X and this Sunday you are so far ahead. Well, we read, we, read, we read the scriptures really three times per week. So Sunday morning, Wednesday morning, and Wednesday night. So when you leave Sunday morning, we read two other chapters from the old, two other chapters on the new, Wednesday morning and Wednesday night. So all I'm asking you, if you really want to keep up with the consistent reading of the scriptures, please just follow that pattern. So during the week, put it in your mind that you're going to read the two following chapters before we come Sunday morning. Is that amen? amen? That is if you want to keep up with the reading. Our lesson for today is Galatians 6, verses 11 to 16. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For with neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto 
the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be to them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. The word of the Lord we say. In these final verses, Paul touches on some of the major themes of the letter. And they center on this one big theme, the cross of Christ. Here the Galatians are reminded as to what is at stake in this controversy as it relates to Christianity and to the Jewish worship. Indeed, Galatians is about a controversy. Interestingly, virtually every letter in the New Testament is written because of controversies. The controversy in Galatians is about the nature of salvation. How are we saved? Some said we are saved by keeping the law. Others believe we are saved by trusting in Jesus Christ, while others believe we are saved by just doing good works. Paul is making one final plea that Jesus paid it all. The false teachers thought that what Jesus did was not enough. Yes, he did something good, but we need to do something more. So Paul pleads one more time with the emotion like a lawyer making his final appeal to a judge and jury that they would realize that Christ's work is enough. Before we go through these applications, note verse 11. Paul said, look at what large letters I use as I write to you in my own handwriting. The large letters signify the importance of this discussion or the message that I'm trying. You know, when we want to send a message to somebody forcefully, apart from those of us who always write in bold, we put it in bold that they can see that we see us. Amen? <laughs> Paul takes the reed pen from his scribe and writes the conclusion in bold script. Everywhere Paul ends with his signature, but here he adds more than his signature. The closing comments are much longer than in his other letters. The benediction is different also. It is conditional. The tone of verse 17 is different. It is sharp. Even though Paul gives a prior wish, there are no personal greetings from others and no expression of praise or thanksgiving in his conclusion as he has done in other texts so as to convey the other group thing. Paul, in this conclusion, he thinks that this is very important. The cross of Jesus Christ is so important that we will not do anything for distraction. And so this morning, from the text, I would like to speak to us on characteristics of a cross-centered life. Characteristics of a cross-centered life. I focus on the following. A cross-centered life is a tractable life. A cross-centered life is a treasured life. And a cross-centered life is a transformed life. First of all, when we talk about tractable, I checked with the Britannica Dictionary, and the word tractable, which I wish to use to convey my message, it means easily managed or controlled, otherwise humble. So the, the life that is controlled by the cross is a humble life. So Jesus Christ, we are told, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That was a tractable life. You cannot make the cross the center of your life and you are not humble. Amen. <laughs> Look at the false religion promoted by these false teachers. The false teachers were, were motivated by self-interest and their own agenda. That's not the center of the cross. Consider the expressions of pride noted by Paul here. Paul says that they were manipulators who compelled them. They were compromisers who wanted to avoid being persecuted. In other words, Paul said they were hypocrites who don't keep the law themselves. They were braggers who loved to boast. The false teachers wanted to avoid persecution from Jewish components, or opponents, sorry. These opponents apparently would not persecute them as long as they followed the law. In addition, they wanted to adulterate the word of God. They want to look to something that was not what God wanted them to be. Paul's word reminds us of Jesus' words to the Pharisees. He criticized them for not keeping the law themselves, for their self-centered motives, and for desiring the praise of others more than the praise of God. And that has not changed among Christians. People still do things just to impress. So here again is the question in the letter. Is true, is true faith, true religion about divine accomplishment or human achievement? If it is about human achievement, then praise the person. If it is about divine accomplishment, then praise God. And sometimes, no matter how people praise God, if they don't praise the person, it's as if they have not done anything yet. And so you know who get the glory. You know where the glory lies. For us, the application is clear. Enter you, so either you glory in the flesh or you glory in the Christ. Choose who you give the glory. One culture is wrapped up with boasting. We exalt popularity, intellect, appearance, income, or job performance, just to name a few. Once we are qualified in these areas, we pat ourselves on the shoulders. It has nothing to do with we live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Many family members are the same. They are not concerned how spiritual their children are as long as they have all that I've just mentioned. And it goes right down to the gutters. Even when they make scam, as long as they bring in the money, it's all right. Paul over says, there is only one acceptable form of boasting, only in the cross. Jesus Christ would have said to us that everything else makes no sense. Lay up for yourself, churches in heaven, where moth and rust can't break through and steal. But forget about this earth because everything is vanity and vexation of spirit, said the wise man. But that's where we glory. As he wrote to the Corinthians, the one who boasts most must boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 31. The only grounds for boasting is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Your grounds for boasting is not what town you live in. Your ground for boasting is not your academic achievement. Your ground for boasting is not what car you can drive. Your ground for boasting is not who you have lined up in your family. Your ground for boasting is not whose hand you shake. The only ground for boasting Boasting is when you are wrapped up and tied up and tangled up in Jesus. The circumcision party is wrapped up in religious boasting. 
they were religious show-offs. My brothers and sisters, false point was that the Jews wanted ecclesiastical statistics. So many circumcisions in a given year was certainly something to boast about. Now, I am exposed to some things that some of you are not exposed to. As a religious leader and then invited to some other religious groups, when you go there, you hear the boastings of a lot of things. And sometimes the competitive boasting. What are their achievements? But they are not boasting in the fact that they are serving God and God is to be served. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. I don't care what you achieve in life, whether it is spiritual, social, economical, national. I don't care what it is unless your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You don't have anything yet. Let me clarify that biblically. Jesus sent out his disciples. And my God, all hell broke loose. What do I mean by that? The Bible says, uh, they came back and says, demon run from us. We heal the sick, raise the dead, blind people and demon possessor. And they came back with rejoicing and boasting. Jesus said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't worry about that and boast about that. Boast that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what Jesus Christ said. Our boasting must not be in our achievement down here. Our boasting must be in our relationship with God that will usher us from here to heaven to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. We need to know why we boast. You could sing like the angel, preach like Paul. You can't preach better than the devil. And you can't sing better than the devil. You didn't know that. Some of the best singers in the world are demon possessed. Sometimes we're playing down the devil, you know. The devil, the devil has it. He has it. A cross-centered life is one that rejects the model of these false teachers. Are you cultivating humility in your life and trying to crucify human pride? How can you do this? You must go to the cross. At the cross, our pride bubble gets popped. There is no room for boasting at Golgotha. We must crucify the flesh and walk by the spirit to cultivate humility and avoid the false teachers and the false patterns. Hello, we don't need no pat on the shoulder. Pat Jesus on his shoulder. He died for us. He makes a difference. We are just receivers of the glory and the blessings of Almighty God. That's where we need to get when we give God the glory. One writer said, and I quote, on one occasion I had tea with Martin Lloyd Jones in London and decided to ask him a question that concerned me. Dr. Lloyd Jones, I said, how can I tell whether I'm preaching in the energy of the flesh or in the power of the spirit? That is very easy, was the reply. Lord Jones replied, as I shriveled, if you are preaching in the energy of the flesh, you will feel exalted and lifted up. If you are preaching in the power of the spirit, you will feel awe and humility. That's the difference. So in other words, once you are doing something and in your spirit is to elevate God, you are in the spirit. But when you are doing it for the glory of self, you have missed the mark and missed it miserably. You are doing it in the energy of the flesh and that will not get you to heaven. Although the work look good. Although the song sound good. Although the preaching great. All of that good, but it's not good enough for heaven. The only thing that qualifies us for heaven is to glory in the cross of Christ Jesus. Secondly, a cross-centered life is a treasured life. Verse 14 of the text. 
It says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul said, I will not boast in myself. He said, but as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will not boast about my preaching. I will, well, I, don't, I can't boast about singing. For so many persons convince me that I can't sing. <laughs> so I won't boast in that here. <laughs> He's trying to find absolute language to emphasize this point. Do not ever boast in anything except the cross. To put it positively, only boast in the cross. Boast means to glory in, make much of, be consumed with, or be mastered by something. It is deep. It comes from your center, from your soul. The psalmist says, we boast in God all day long. We will praise your name forever. May it never be that we would ever make much of anything or ever glory in anything or by master or be mastered by anything except the cross of Jesus Christ except our connection with Jesus Christ except the fact that we are convinced that we are saved oh my brothers and my sisters it doesn't matter the type of funeral we have if we were not connected with God we are gone to hell so the glory must not be in our our achievement here on earth our glory must be our connection with Jesus Christ of Nazareth boasting in the cross implies that you place your confidence in Christ and his work for your salvation you are not trusting in your religious facts or acts cross exalters rest everything in what Christ has done cross exalters believe that Jesus lived the life we could not live and died the death we should have died those who boast in the cross simply say this is for my peace Jesus died in my my place boasting in the cross implies that God accept you because of the work of Jesus Christ I should have been crucified I should have suffered and died but Jesus Christ has taken my place and so the life that I now live I live in the name of Jesus Christ who gave himself for me that's where my boasting is my boasting is the fact that Jesus died for me I was lost and undone but he intervened rescued me from hell that's my boasting my boasting is my connection with almighty God through Jesus Christ The wrath of God will not be poured out on me because of the cross. Because of the cross, I am united with Christ. <laughs> because of the cross, I am dead to this world and all its claims on my life. Because of the cross, I have become a new creation. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away and all things become new. So boast in the cross, my brothers and my sisters. Revel in the cross. Rejoice in the cross and not in self. Boast only in the cross because every spiritual blessing you enjoy or will enjoy is due to the cross. Everything we enjoy as new creations is owing to the cross. Do you enjoy justification? Boast in the cross. Do you enjoy redemption? Boast in the cross. Do you enjoy adoption? Boast in the cross. Do you enjoy the spirit flowing through you? Give credit to the cross because it is through the cross of Jesus Christ that we have connection. Hallelujah. 
The cross has a present power in our lives. The cross has the power to free us from the world's bondage. The world speaks of the system and nature of this age. Corruption, meaninglessness, hopelessness, futility, warped values, and despairs are all aspects of the world. How many of you seated right here now and online? You couldn't tell when last you watched the news for your can't take it. You don't have to identify yourself. It is so despairing and disgusting and disappointing and devastating. Every time you turn on, 90% of the news is that a man get killed and somebody get robbed and somebody get raped and there's war in the east and war in the west and you're tired of it, you can't deal with it no more. So for a peace of mind, you know, worry worry to watch the television news or to listen to the news. Paul says the believer and the world are dead to each other. The two have parted ways. Our position in one sense objectively, forensically, is this. We have been crucified already with Jesus. We belong to him. The best way to understand this phrase in 14b of the text, I have been crucified with Christ. You can find that in chapter 2 and verse 19. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and and gave himself for me. This life is not my own. Now my body has become the body of Jesus Christ. I am just moving according to the spirit that lives in me. That's where we need to get as Christians. Our position in one sense objectively is the position that Jesus Christ is in us. So we died but we live. There is a new I, the old self has died, the rebellious, enslaved, unbelieving self died. Now there is a new I, a new creation. Lord Jesus, sometimes some people say they see me, you can't find that. Hello. Sometimes when you get some among some Christians, I have to go home and say, what we, what, 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 I thought I heard that that person was saying. But that the type of behavior there, where you come from? Certainly not cross-centered. And sometimes you slap yourself. Oh, leave it alone. Paul wants us to know that when Christ died, we died to the world. And now we live a new life in him. It does not mean that the world does not affect us. The death blow has been dealt at the cross. But the world still has a lingering influence. One day though, when Christ returns, there will be no more corruption. Now the Christian life is about becoming what we are. We are dead to this world and alive to Christ. The world is not the believer's treasure. Christ is our treasure. Christ is the one that we treasure we do not treasure the things of this world if your greatest focus is on the things of this world you need to check your connection because something is not right with your spiritual connection if the things of this world your achievement and all this is your greatest treasure then something wrong with the real treasure the real treasure has to be the cross of Jesus Christ it must be above all, before all, at all times. Get connected with the cross and glory in the cross. On account of the cross, the cares of this world do not have to crush us because we have a different perspective than that of the world. 
You know that uh, if God will give you Christ, uh, he will give all you need ultimately. The enticement of the world do not have to persuade us uh, like they do the rest of society because we have new affections. Greed can be replaced uh, by generosity, lust with purity, anxiety with truth, envy with love. Oh my God, that's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to be transformed. It does let me transformation has nothing to do with our book, our name on the church record. Regardless Regardless of what church. Paul said, live this out. Live out the cross. Live as though this world has nothing to you for you and Christ is everything to you. Die to the enticement and cares of this world. Live as though Christ were your ultimate treasure. The motto for the Christian is, the world has nothing for us. Christ is everything to us. This is the daily power of the cross. Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher, in a sermon called Grand Glorying, writes these amazing words. What means he by this? Why he means that he ever, sin ever since he fell in love with Jesus Christ, he lost all love for the world. It seemed to him to be a poor, crucified, dying thing, and he turned away from it, just as you would from a criminal whom you might see hanging in chains, and would desire to go anywhere rather than see the poor being. So Paul seemed to see the world on gallows, on gallows, hung on a tree. There he said, that is what I think of you and all your pomp and pride and all your power and all your wealth and all your fame. You are on the gallows, a, a, a malfactor, malfactor nailed up, crucified. I would not give uh, anything for you, end of quote. Now observe the other cross. There is Paul on that. The world thinks as little of Paul as Paul was of the world. The world says, oh, the, oh this Paul, this, this silly man, he was once sensible, but he has gone mad upon that stubborn notion about the crucified one. This, listen, my man. When he spoke to Agrippa, I said, Paul, too much learning has made you mad. In other words, you were great when you were in the learning position, but now you lick your head. But one writer said, I'd rather be a fool for Christ than a genius for the devil. Too many of us are geniuses for the devil. Fools for, and, and, and not for Christ. Can you look at your idols this morning? Is it Jesus or your money? Is it the cross or your success? Is it the cross or human praise? Is it the cross or human power? Is it the cross or peer approval? Is it the cross or wanting attention? Is it the cross or ungodly romance? And I'll spend a little time on that. Jesus is getting your attention, but because of the anger, the Romans, and the man say, or the woman say, if you go to Jesus, I'll let you say, brother, I'll take this here with you. All right, when you get a hell gate, you better ask him to appeal for you. And you know that, go. <laughs> See your idols as they are. Your idols are pathetic, crucified, dying things. They are not attractive to the person who sees them for what they are and sees Jesus for who he is. I challenge you this morning that your glory must be in Jesus and in Jesus alone. The Bible said it's better to go to heaven without the right hand or a right high or any eyes at all and than to go to heaven or go to hell with everything. Everything. And guess what? We can't carry nothing good on there. Every day, so often, I said at a particular place, 
We brought nothing into this world. And we can take nothing. I'm not going to say where I say it because some people don't like the tone of it. But that's the facts of it. <laughs> and I don't want your heart to get sad. When I tell you that all of us one day, that will be said. Well, let me close off. So a cross-centered life is a tractable life. A cross-centered life is a treasured life. And finally, a cross-centered life is a transformed life. Verses 15 and 16 of the text says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be to them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. The cross has done for us what the flesh could not do. The Bible says, There is therefore no, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It was done what law-keeping could not do. Christ has made us new people through his work on the cross. Earlier, Paul said that circumcision or uncircumcision does not accomplish anything. Only faith working through love masters. In other words, brothers and sisters, he values internal change, not external ritual. Now he says something similar. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. Come explain that. For some of us know that just run off our head because we're not circumcised or uncircumcised. Simply put it another way. Baptism. Baptism take the form of circumcision. You could have baptized ten times. I know see it. But you know we have some churches you know. Every time them say you sin then baptize you again. But you know why sometimes the people are counting the same thing because they are not transformed. Baptism do not save you. It is your relationship with Jesus Christ. This verse reflects what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 21, where he ties the cross to the new creation. In that letter, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and look, new things have become. What does a new creation look like? Look like Galatians 2, 19 to 20. These wonderful verses put boasting in the cross and a new creation together, a person who is united to Jesus Christ, who died on his behalf, is never the same person again. He has become a new creation. So help me, God, if you say you save and the same dirty attitude in you, and then you tell everybody, says Sumitan, I want to tell you this morning on air, your turn bad. And for those who are listening to me online, you stay bad. And because you stay bad, you're going to end bad. If you are born again, you got to change. For the power of God, the power of the cross is going to change you. And if you are not changed this morning, you need to check with God. You are not yet born again. I don't care what you do in the church. I don't care what you do in the community. I don't care what you do at workplace. There has to be changes. Or if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You don't tell me that you are changed and a soyotan. Christianity is not about being a nice person. Trying harder. Are just being religious. It's about becoming a new person. This new life is made possible by the cross. A new creations in Christ. We are now fit for a new creation. 
the new creation has done with the coming of Christ. We live between the times of his coming. We will enjoy the blessings of new creation because of the cross. Circumcision, our new creation. Paul says only the latter represents biblical Christianity. For you may perform all sorts of religious rituals, but none of it matters if you have not become a new creation in Christ. Many people today think that uh, there are only two ways to live. They believe that they can either be religious or irreligious. They think that they have to keep a set of rules or they can, can live free of rules like a, like a hedonist. Most most irreligious people think that when you are calling them to Christ, you are calling them to a religion. But the gospel is something else. It is a third way. It is not about religious acts. It is not primarily a code of ethics. It is not exploit. It is about being united with Christ who then works in his followers, empowering them to live differently. My brothers and my sisters, this is what we are calling you to. We are calling you to a new life. Hello, you can stop smoking and still not transform. You can stop fornicating and still not transform. You can stop drinking and still not transform. The real transformation is when Jesus change you. Go to our council for your junkin problem. And he managed to help you to stop. But if you die, you're still going to hell. For you're not saved. As I close, Paul says this new gospel community called the church walks by a standard. The word standard is known, which means a measuring rod, our carpenter's rule. It is the word we use for canon of scriptures which measure the Bible. Timothy George summarizes this verse. Paul invokes the peace and mercy of God upon those who remain faithful to the truth of the gospel Paul had originally preached among them. My brothers and sisters, once more, this reminds us that theology, the study of God matters, that theology is important, the word of God, that good, sound, gospel-centered preaching and teaching is still essential. Ultimately, this is something for which the whole church is responsible. My brothers and sisters, we can come up with all sorts of gimmicks to get people in church, but only the word of God can transform people and change people. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, um, pierced into the divine asunder of soul and marrow. We must preach the word in season and out of Caesar. Share the word. The Bible said in Deuteronomy, share it with your children. Put it up on your doorposts and everywhere. Let them know that the word is the word. My God, everything else grasp the mind of the young people, even Christian young people, because they get turned off from instilling the word. But I call upon you this morning in the name of Jesus. Let them know the word. Instill the word. Let them get frustrated with the word but tell them the word be instant in Caesar and out of Caesar stand up like Joshua and said as for me and my house we're going to serve God Almighty as long as you are with me I am declaring the word of God for the word makes the difference the cross make a difference my brothers and sisters glory in everything you want to glory in the, the wise man Solomon said enjoy your youth man live your life man enjoy yourself but remember that there is a day of reckoning remember that you're going to have to stand before God promote your children promote your family do anything but remember there is a day of reckoning hallelujah and if you're a watchman you better watch for parents you're watchmen and women for your children how 
husband, you're a watchman for your wife. Wife, you're a watchwoman for your husband and family. Lord God Almighty, present the cross to them in the morning, in the evening. If they die before you, you only ball because you miss them. But you don't have to sing, I wonder. Hallelujah. Paul is urging us to keep in step with this teaching. Let me encourage you to walk according to the gospel, to walk according to the spirit. Keep in step with the gospel, not the world. The world have an agenda, but God Almighty, man, we must have our own agenda. Christians, we have to have the agenda. Let the neighbor know your agenda. Your agenda is Jesus Christ. Let your husband know your agenda. Your agenda is Jesus Christ. Let your wife know your agenda. Your agenda is Jesus Christ. Let the pity the them know who run things. It is God first, and then me second but if you have another agenda hmm. we are closing you need to come to the cross some of you and I don't know what's your agenda but the cross is not your agenda. Why? Because all know you are rebellious against the cross. All know you're not willing to bow the knee. But so help me God that you'll do it before God knock on your door. So I encourage you this morning to come to the cross. The song of as closing is 477. I am coming to the cross. I am poor and weak and blind. I am counting all but dross. I shall full salvation find. The cross makes it. Outside of that, there's nothing. You are nothing. You have nothing unless you have Jesus.
final appeal to anyone who has not surrendered to the cross. We are going to sing the third verse as the last verse. Brethren, only the cross makes the difference. Examine your life. I'm not asking if you are baptized. I'm not asking you this morning if you attend church. I'm not asking you anything like that. I'm asking you, is the cross the priority in your life? And if that is not the case, the altar is yours this morning. Here I give my all to thee. Friends and time and earth store. Soul and body thine to be holy thine forevermore. That's what you are called upon to do this morning. And if you have not yet done that, as we do this verse as the last, join these at the altar. Blessed Lamb of Calvary, humbly at thy cross I bow. Jesus, save me, save me now. Take my mind off everything else that attracts me. Because, Lord, everything in this life is temporary. My family, temporary. My finance, temporary. My physical fitness, temporary. Everything, temporary. The only lasting thing is my relationship with you. And you declare that I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So, Father God, I pray for those who are prizing land and possession and prizing friendship and all of those things this morning. I pray for those who find it difficult to surrender to you because of something or someone in their life. I pray God that they will understand that there are going to be some separation. Either that they are separated or the things are separate from them because there is no permanent connection on this side of life. The only permanent connection is the one between us and you and I pray God Almighty for these people standing at this altar that they will get their priority right. The priority is that they will connect to the cross of the Calvary of Jesus Christ. They will and whatever it takes this morning. Lord I'm thankful that they had the courage to move from their seats. Now Lord I pray that by the grace of God you will help them to take it further so they will say with the songwriter that they will place their hands in the hands of the man who still the water place their hands in the hands of the man who calmed the sea for God long time you are reaching out to them this morning they have made the first move Lord Jesus are you made the first move by calling them they have made a second move by coming to the altar no Lord I pray that they will trust you I pray that they will give you all I pray that they will just surrender to you Lord because the real thing is their connection with the cross there is nothing else that makes sense for a long time it seemed to make sense right now but for a long time it values nothing and so this morning wake up their knowledge wake up their spirit wake up their connection in the name of Jesus Christ that they will leave this altar this morning with the conviction that transformation has taken place hmm for those online who would love to be at this altar but they can't 
right where they are in their bedroom, in their cars, in their workplace, wherever they are this morning, I pray that they will surrender to you in the name of Jesus. Let the cross be the difference in their life. Paul said, I glory in nothing else. Paul was an educated man. He didn't glory in his academics. He didn't glory in his status as a Pharisee. He didn't glory in anything. He didn't glory in his apostolic uh, apostleship. He glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. May that be the cry of the heart of your people under the sound of my voice today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. If you are at the altar and you are not saved, Please stand here. Somebody will talk to you. You're not a Christian. Just keep standing at the altar. Do not go back to your seat. We're not going to hold you down and do anything.